Hello, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started with the webinar now today. So I'm going to be um, I'm going to be your presenter today, uh, Tim Coyle, I'm lead consultant founder at Signal Bytes Technology, and I've been doing a uh, hardware design engineering for over 15 years now, uh, mostly in signal and power integrity, and quite a bit with IBIS modeling. And that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this webinar today to share some IBIS modeling quality items with you guys. So here at uh, Signal Bytes Technology, you know we provide hardware consulting services, and we also develop some signal integrity design rule check software. So our first one is called IBIS DRST, which allows you to run uh, design rule checks on your IBIS models. And um, we're going to talk about some of the things that you can do with design rule checks and IBIS model quality today as well. So for all of you guys that signed up and are attending the webinar, you're going to get this free book on IBIS model that I wrote uh, a few years ago called Hacking IBIS Models for Signal Integrity Analysis. Now, everything that's going to be in these, uh, this presentation today is in the book and even more. So it's a really good resource to use, and I hope you guys um, you know, find some use for it and on doing your, your modeling and stuff. And I have to say that this is the best book on IBIS modeling because it is the only book that's solely on IBIS modeling. So I get that distinction of being the best. But no, it's, um, you know, I try to write it so that it's, it's pretty informative, it's easy to read, um, and it will get you... Uh, get you to where you need to go when you're working with IBIS models uh, for signal integrity design. Okay, so let's talk about today's webinar. So we're going to cover a couple of things today. And the first thing is we're going to do a brief overview of what an IBIS model is and why it's important. And then I'm going to talk about model quality issues and how that can cause products to fail. And then we're really going to get into the seven deadly sins of simulation and how you can avoid them. And then I'll finish that off with how you can take control of model quality in your simulation. Okay? So here we go. Let's get started. So overview of an IBIS model. So why do we use IBIS models? So remember that IBIS simulation models are used for signal integrity analysis to uh, validate interface timing and signal quality, okay? And here I've just shown a little graph here, a little chart that kind of shows an input waveform at a receiver. And really what this is doing is kind of calling out some of your standard, you know, signal integrity uh, quality issues in terms of, you know, um, overshoot and undershoot and ring back and uh, settling time. And so really, you know, IBIS models are representing your I.O. buffers right, so they're representing your drivers and your receivers, and you want to use these in your simulation, right, to be able to, be able to um, you know, go over your full system design and determine what your margin is. So this is why we're using IBIS models. So what's an IBIS model? So this is kind of a classic block diagram of an IBIS model. And here, normally what we'll use is sort of a, a standard push-pull CMOS driver. So you have a PMOS and an MOS that represent your pull-up and your pull-down. And then, of course, there's some capacitance that's related to your total buffer. And then you've got some ESD clamps, you know, that go to the ground into power. And then you've got a simple package model represented by an RLC. So when you look at this pull-up and pull-down structure, there's these uh, IV and VT curves, which are really lookup tables, okay? And these really represent the I.O. buffer. And then again, you've got some I.O. capacitance, and this is modeled as a lump capacitance, and then you've got a package that's represented by a lumped RLC. And so this sort of this sort of makes up the basic components of your IBIS model. Now when we look at the IV and the VT data curves, it, it's it's a good way to look at them like this in terms of, you know, consider each of your, your PMOS and your NMOS, your pull-up and your pull-down, as a variable resistor. And you can look at the IV curve on that. <clears throat> and you can kind of see how if you've got this IV curve and this data and that you can turn this into kind of a behavioral model that now you know sort of the drive strength of when your um, driver is driving high and when your driver is driving low. 
But there's still one piece missing from that, okay? And this is what the voltage time data does. This is used, this, the voltage time data is there, you know, basically to tell you when to turn the transistors on and off. So they're kind of like switches, okay? You know, and you typically have got, you know, voltage time data that shows for each of your pull up and pull down, you know, um, when they turn on and when they turn off. And so when you take these two data sets together um, as a, a, a total IBIS model file, then what happens is in a signal integrity simulator, it's going to take this data and it's going to use some sort of algorithm to put it together and recreate the output of your I.O. buffer. Okay? So that's kind of the basics here of, of what, what an IBIS model is, why we're using it, and sort of the, the major components of it. And the last thing here is an example model file. And I'm showing a full model file, but I'm just trying to show you guys that if you look on sort of the right-hand screen, if you're not that familiar with looking at the IBIS files themselves, is that it's ASCII text and that there's these keywords in here, so these bracket words that are blue, so you have your IBIS version, and then it goes down there. And if you look on the left, you can kind of see where there's different things, like a model, you could see the pull-down curve, and you know you could go here and graph this. And this is the IBIS DRC uh, editing tool, but you know there's other um, IBIS data viewers out there as well. Um, so this is just to kind of show you that this is you know what the model file looks like that you get at the end of the day, right? And so that was kind of your your little uh, five-minute tour of IBIS models, okay? So that's kind of the overview and some of the pieces, okay? So let's talk about let's talk about how bad models can get product failures, okay? So think of it like this. If you take your final board design, okay, and then you're going to want to put this in time, some type of signal integrity simulator, okay? If you use your IBIS model to represent your drivers and receivers, and you've got your board file that's represent your transmission lines, that's parameters, connectors, all that together, and you simulate it, and you're going to get some sort of result, right? The problem with this is if you don't validate your IBIS model, then you can't trust the results, right? And so I'll give you an example of an actual product failure I've seen in the, in the field is a company <clears throat> had a board design. They had an IBIS model. They did singletary simulations. They had results. They thought the results were good. They got their boards back. They started to bring up, and then they noticed that they had a lot of reflections, a lot of ringing, and they were just having a lot of problems with signal quality. And it turns out what happened is, is the IBIS model that they had had the wrong drive strength and edge rate. So it was a stronger driver and a faster edge rate than they thought they had. And so that was causing excess ringing. And their solution for their particular case you know, they had to redesign their board and add in some serious termination to damp the ringing, right? And so that's the situation that you don't want to end up in. And when we talk about the seven deadly sins, we're going to kind of go over some of the scenarios where even if you think you have a good IBIS model, you might not. So these, this is the exact type of scenario that we want to try and avoid here, okay? So. Let's talk about the seven deadly sins of the simulation and how you can avoid them. So the first one is kind of what we just talked about, and that's not quality checking your IBIS model, okay? And the way to solve this is by putting the flow in place in the in quality check your IBIS model. Now, before we talk anymore, I'm going to try and launch a poll here, okay? And let's see. Okay, so I've got this poll open. I'm asking you guys essentially, you know, what percentage of IBIS models you think aren't accurate for, um, aren't suitable for simulation, right? And so I'll let you guys run these through for, for, for a couple of seconds here until everybody votes, and then, and then we'll tally up and see how close you guys can come. Right, because that's the question we get asked a lot, right, when they do consult as well. How bad are, how bad are good IBIS models, right? So let's, Let's see, let's see how close you guys can get. All right, still voting, still voting. All right, pretty much everybody's voted, so we'll take it. Okay, so. What you guys said 
is 12% said it was 10%. 58% said 30, 31% said 60, okay? And the exciting answer is 60%. So about 60% of you guys thought that it was actually lower, right? So there's only what percentage of IBIS models? 30%. It's actually 60. So 60% of models aren't suitable for signal integrity analysis. So that's about half, okay? So that's about half of your models aren't going to be good for simulation right off of the bat. Now some of these might have errors that are easy to fix and some are more complicated to fix, okay? But that's what you're going to run into, okay? And so that's what I kind of wanted to um, show you guys and, and get you to start thinking about is that you've got to deal with model quality up front, okay? So, but there's, there's silver lining here. And what the good news is, is that means about 40%, or quite a few of the IC vendors are doing a good job with their IBIS model, okay? And one uh, IC company that I'll call out for doing good models is Micron. And I always use Micron as an example because I think they do a really good job. If you go and download, you know, a memory IBIS model for Micron, you know, you're going to find that they comment their model, um, they deliver you, you know, a quality checklist showing that you, they check things and they also give you a correlation report, which is really good. And not, obviously not a lot of vendors do that, okay? So if there's any Micron guys on the line, you guys are going to be spared today. You guys are doing a good job. But I will say at the end of the day that model quality is like anything in engineering. It's the responsibility of everybody, right? So yes, the IT vendors should, you know, deliver quality models and, and, and do what they need to do, but also um, it's up to us and you guys as engineers to also quality check on your end as well, okay? Okay, someone, uh, uh, someone just asked a question, where did this data come from? That's a good question. Um, so this is a survey that I did um, a little while ago using our our IBIS quality tools. So what I did is I downloaded um, uh, like 100 different models for, um, from different vendors and I ran them through different levels of quality checking and then started, you know, binning them after they had errors. And then the IBIS book, um, modeling book that you're going to get a copy of, the data and everything is there in the upfront. It's kind of like the opening, the preface that talks about, um, you know, model quality issues and, and sort of what you're going to see if you take a sample of different models, okay? So hopefully that answers your question, but um, yeah, that's a good question. That's where that data is coming from. Okay, so if we go move on to the second one, the second deadly sin, okay? Not running the IBIS parser, okay? Now, what is the IBIS parser? So the IBIS parser is a standalone tool, okay? And it's developed by, you know, I'll say the working specification group that develops the actual IBIS spec, okay? And so anyone can go and download a standalone version of this parser. It's got Linux and Windows executables. Um, and also a lot of the major EDA tools pay the license to include it in their tool. And the whole idea of the IBIS parser is that it'll run standalone in your IBIS model file and tell you if there's any errors in it. Okay, so I've got this screenshot that kind of shows what it looks like running it from a command line on Windows, right? So up at the top, it tells you what version it is, tells you it's checking for the IBIS model um, compatibility, whatever version, you know, the IBIS model is, and then it gives you your errors or warnings, okay? Now, what the IBIS parser is doing is, is it's checking what it can in the IBIS model based on the, the IBIS specification. So, you know, it can check, you know, typos, it can check if you've got pull up or pull down data there. And over the years it's evolved to try and even do some basic data integrity checks, which is good. But what it can't do is it can't check everything. And it, what really what it can't do is it can't check your IBIS model against the ICE sheet, which is really where it needs to go, okay? So for example, what it can't do is it can't check to see if say the output impedance is 40 ohms, right? Because you can't provide any parameters to the IBIS parser uh, to check on that. Think of it more of a specification checker, okay? But it's really your first line of defense. Um, and this is the first thing that you really need to run on your IBIS model. 
And unfortunately, sometimes some vendors don't even run it through the parser or ignore the errors, right? So if you have an error, you really can't even use it for simulation. Most of the simulation tools won't even run it if there's an error. And if there is an error and it does run, there's no way you're going to be able to um, be able to determine if your results are accurate or not. Okay, so someone's asking the question, should we worry about the non-monotonic warning? You know, and that's a, that's a good question, okay? Um, and, the, and the answer is that you really shouldn't worry if it's a warning, okay? Um, because really, and this is a little more complex, and I'll cover it, it's, it's in the book, though, I talk about this issue, but basically what happens is, is for like an output model uh, or an I.O. model that has both uh, pull up and pull, pull up and pull down curves and also clamp curves is the way the IBIS specification works is you have to separate them out, but then when you simulate, you add them together. So sometimes when you add those curves together, you get a little bit of a numerical uh, you know, fuzzy number thing, you know. So it looks like it's non-monotonic, but it's such a small value that it doesn't really matter, okay? Um, so in general, if it's a warning, you should be okay with it. But um, as you go, as we go through these other things and talk about, you know, some other issues with quality, is if you do more checks than just running the parser, you'll be able to determine if that is a real issue or not, okay? So hopefully I answered your question on that. So, Again, running the IBIS parser, what I say about the IBIS parser is it's your first line of defense, but it's not your last line of defense, okay? Because you have to go beyond the IBIS parser. And in some ways, I think uh, an unintended consequence of, of having this parser release is that it's made a lot of people think and believe that if it passes the IBIS parser, then it's a good model. And that's not necessarily true. Like we just said, you know, the IBIS parser isn't going to tell you if the electrical characteristics of the I.O. match the data sheet, because that's not what it's intended to do. So this is your first line of defense, but it's not your last line of defense. So let's talk about the package, okay? Um, so this is just a snapshot of the package piece in an IBIS file, right? So you have a PIN number and a signal name and then the actual IBIS uh, buffer that you um, that it's referenced to, and then your RLC pin to it. Okay. The problem is that um, when you use an IMS model post layout simulation tool, right, it's going to map that pin section to the entire component. Okay, and they need to match 100%. So if it's like a 20 pin I/O, right, and if the vendor decides, well, you know, we don't need all these, you know just pin three and four are both output pins and they, they point to the same output model, so we'll just put one in there. Well, that's fine, you know, in, in somewhat legal by the specification, but from a quality point of view, it's bad because if you go and load this up in your PCB simulation tool and run a, run a simulation with post layout, it's going to give you errors because it won't be able to find pin three and you'll have to go back and edit these. So this is, this is a, a common error or issue I see a lot with uh, um, vendor models is they're not giving you the complete uh, package pinout, right? So you want to make sure that's in there, especially if you're doing your post layout simulations, okay? And another issue that I'm starting to see more and more of is, is what I'm going to call model bandwidth, okay? And now if you look up there and you see this RLC, so what IBIS, initial IBIS intended is that a lumped RLC model is going to represent your entire package, right? So that means the entire trace in your package, the vias, uh, uh, and the bumps, and the C4, and the whole thing, right? And that works fine if you're under the assumption that a lumped model has adequate bandwidth for you. So I've got a little uh, image I stole from um, an optimal EDA app note. And what this is, what this is doing is just, it's going to go over basic transmission line theory of a lumped RLC element and talk about how, based on your edge rate, as your edge rates get faster and faster, you need more stages or you need, a, you need to increase the bandwidth of your model, okay? And so, for example, what I see in some, some fast interfaces like a DDR3-2133 or a DDR4-3200 is that um, a simple lumped RLC model isn't always adequate. It doesn't have enough bandwidth 
depending on the edge rate, okay? So this is something that you need to start checking and keep in mind, and this is a good instance of where you can go to your IT vendor and say, hey, so you guys are using a lump ROC, looks like it's got fast edge rate, uh, fast frequency uh, bandwidth, tell me that this model is adequate, show me some correlation data, you know, or give me uh, something beyond a lumped RLC model. You know, give me an S parameter package model or, you know, a mixed spice model. So there's, you can go to your vendor and have a discussion and see what they, what they can offer you, but, you know, you should keep this in mind when you're doing simulations to check your edge rates in consideration of, of how, how these RLC package models are, are being used. Okay, so someone's asking, um, is the package as parameter accurate RLC parameters in the IBIS file? So I think I kind of just talked about that, um, right, is that the RLC is adequate for a lot of simulations and a lot of interfaces, but it really depends on that edge rate and how that edge rate is going to make it have the right bandwidth or not, okay? And I, I believe this is in the, the um, IBIS modeling book as well. So this is, a, this is another thing to kind of put on your list your overall checklist to make sure that you're looking at, right? Now, you don't need to be concerned about it if the edge rate is slow enough, right? Um, but you've got you to start watching some of these faster ones. Okay, so let's go to number four, okay? Output impedance and edge rates. Now, again, I'm showing this thing graphic here of looking at, you know, an input waveform at a receiver with lots of signal uh, quality problems. And, you know, one way to think about signal integrity, and an important part of it, is it's your driver, right? So the drive strength, the IV curving IMIS model that defines the output impedance of your driver, right? And then that voltage time curve in the ramp data is your edge rate. And impedance and edge rates really define your signal quality. Okay, now we can get in this discussion of, you know, you know, your I.O., your transmitter receiver characteristics versus, you know, matching those with your board, you know, match impedance on the board and have good crosstalk rules. But it's, it's really a play between the two, right? And so you have this opportunity, though, in your IBIS file to understand what the output impedance and edge rates are. And you want to make sure that those line up to what you think they are or line those up into what you know, the ranges of those should be. And again, I can go back to the example of, you know, a company trying to, you know, build a board design, thinking that their, their drive strength and edge rate is a lot slower and weaker than what it is in reality and how that's going to cause you signal quality problems, okay? And so, you know, you guys, hopefully you guys can kind of see the importance of an IDIS model and how it can be used to even start thinking about signal integrity before you even start simulating, okay? Because you can start seeing how these things can be used to sort of start doing design and analysis, you know, before you even go and run full level simulation. The AC timing load. So this is a really common, this is actually the most common uh, warning and error you'll see when you run an IBIS model through through even the parse or even through a first line defense, okay? And this is really about, you know, timing, uh, about the timing load that's available in the IBIS specification, right? And so remember, the whole idea when you do signal integrity simulations is flight time. You want to know the time it takes to go from the output of your driver to the input of your receiver, right? Because remember, the internal timing of the receiver, the setup and hold, you're going to get that from the vendor data sheet. And the output time and the time to clock out of your transmitter, you get that from your data sheet. So when you run simulations with any model, IBIS or SPICE, you want to subtract those out from your simulation, right? So that's normally classically your flight time delay. Now, in order to do that, most tools are going to use this AC timing load from the vendor data sheet that's put in the IBIS model, okay? And this timing load is there to represent the manufacturer's load. And so hopefully you can see on the left here that you kind of subtract, you know, from uh, your system load to your test load. And this is more in the book, and it can be a little bit confusing if, if you're, uh, it's been a while since you've gone through the, the flight time calculations and things like that. But what's important to know is that some of the EDA tools are going to use this test load 
okay, in your IBIS model and run simulations behind the scenes of, of even your system board simulation. And they're With um, uh, with running you know PCI simulations for IBIS uh, and signal integrity, and so um, you know one of the reasons why this ends up missing in, in um, you know IC vendor models a lot is because you don't run simulation to get this or anything right. When you make your IBIS model, you have your data and you put it together. So these are just keyword values. These are just you know uh, data declarations that you need to put inside the IBIS model. So if you forget that. Then, then they're not in there if you put in the wrong values, right? And so this is a case of uh, another example of showing you why you need to kind of think about going beyond the IBIS parser because the parser will tell you if that load's there or not, but it can't tell you if that load is the exact values from the data sheet, okay? Okay, so let's go to number six overclocking your VT data. So when you look at your voltage time data window, okay, this ideally is going to show you transition states. So if you pull up and pull down, going from you know low to high and then high to low. Right? And the way the simulation tool is going to use this data is it's going to try and switch the IBIS data, right? So try and switch your model based on this transition time window. But if this time window is too long compared to the input switching frequency, you can get errors in results, right? So one way to think about this is, let's say it takes you know 10 nanoseconds to go from a, a low to high transition, but you want to try and switch it at a faster rate than that. So you want to try and switch it within five nanoseconds. So within five nanoseconds, right, your signal integrity simulation tool is going to want to try and switch from going from a low to high, say, to a high to low. But the actual IBIS data there hasn't fully transitioned up to the steady state. So you're going to start essentially switching in between transition states. And that's going to cause a whole bunch of problems. It's going to cause you, know, you to miss uh, drop bits or, or, or give you weird results in your simulation tools, OK? It used to be a lot bigger problem than it was before. So now a lot of tools try to fix this for you. Right, so they try um, they try to deal with some of these different uh, lead-in times, and they try and deal with trying to just focus on where the data transitions, and they do this on the fly for you. But sometimes this can cause you problems because sometimes it'll it'll you know it's going to manipulate the data on some level. And most of the tools do a good job now, but in the beginning they didn't. So it's it's actually better to make sure that this isn't a problem for you. Uh, before you even start. I know the top, there's kind of this, this little, uh, you know, way to think about it that your time window needs to be less than half of the input period of your switching frequency, okay? So that's kind of your guideline to use to determine if, if that's going to get overclocked or not. Um, Okay, so that, that was talking about overclocking uh, VT data. And so you, you see that a lot with the, with the faster uh, simulation interfaces, and we're seeing that um, come up a lot more with different people, um, you know, talking about it. Okay, so if I go... And now we're going to try and go to the last one, okay? And so this last one, what I'm really talking about is simulation and correlation. And so what this does is this is really going to try and um, tie it together for you. Now, if this, the first one's pretty basic, right? And so what you need to do is you need to simulate the IBIS model in the EAD, in
everything. But with an IBIS model, you know, you can run it simply into, say, the manufacturer's test load, you know, simple RC load or some type of C load. You can even do a basic transmission line, and you can quickly see that, you know, one, the IBIS model is going to stimulate right, and two, you can look at some simple metrics, um, you know, to determine, like, if the edge rates match up. Right, and now also when you look at simulation and correlation, is you can ask your IC vendor for correlation data. Well, most IBIS models are actually generated from SPICE model data, right? So you should be able to get the SPICE model simulated to the same test load as the IBIS model and have those waveforms or have some sort of comparison so you can get an understanding of the accuracy of the IBIS model, right? And, you know, some people get caught up in sort of the correlation pieces of, well, you know, I've got a waveform of the IBIS model into a test load, a waveform of, of the SPICE model in the same test load, and I've got two waveforms overlay, and I want to do some complicated things to see how accurate it is. You know, I like to keep it simple and just take a handful of metrics. You know, the ones I like to use is look at the output voltage levels, the high and low, I'll look at the output edge rates, and look at the duty cycle. And between those five things, you're really going to get a good idea as to whether that's going to be a good model or not. That's really all you need to do, that and looking at the waveforms. So you don't need complicated algorithms to determine if these are actually going to be um, a good correlation or not, okay? And, you know, when we talk about simulation and correlation, this is really the last piece to tie it together. And, you know, and this is going beyond just running the parser and model quality checks is, is you're, you know, by simulating it, correlating it, you're really closing that whole loop, you know. And there's different ways you can do correlation. If you, like I said, you can do correlation to the original SPICE model data if you can get it, or you can even go into the lab and grab, um, you know, some data there and compare it to the actual silicon, you know, process corner that you have. So there's different levels of complexity and different levels that you can go in terms of your correlation. Okay, so I kind of went over those, uh, the seven deadly sins. I tried to touch on, you know, some of it was, was sort of process flow, and then some of it was some specific issues that you're going to run into a lot, right? Because you know, that's, that's kind of, uh, that piece is sort of about what I get asked a lot. It's like, well, what are the most common issues that you see with IVIS models, or what are, what are some of the more common, you know, quality issues I'm going to run into? And now these next couple of slides, it's going to be sort of answering how you take control of your model quality simulation. How do you set up a flow so that you can deal with IBIS models and deal with these quality issues? And so this is the quality check flow that I use, okay? Right, the first one is to run the IBIS parser. Again, this is your first line of defense, but it's not your last line of defense. And the next thing is you need to check the package pinout, and we talked about that. And that's, again, that's important to make sure that, you know, your pin models are there and that they have the right, you know, if it's an output, it's an output. And I always think it's a good idea to view the IBIS IV and VT data. Now, in reality, this is kind of optional, because if you run some deeper quality checks, you can kind of check everything you need to do. But especially when you're starting out kind of with a manual process, if you only have one model, you can look at the IV and the VT data curves and you can start to get an intuitive sense of whether there's going to be a problem with the model or not. You know, especially if you look at, you know, some sort of curve and you know that it's supposed to have a linear slope or something, you see, you know, a big glitch in the middle of it, you know right away that something's wrong with this model. So that's an easy way to do a manual check to figure out if your model quality is going to be good or not. You know, and the number four is running the custom model quality checks. So this is really, you know, going beyond the IBIS parser, looking at things like output impedance, looking at things like um, edge rates. Um, there's actually something called the IBIS quality checklist, which was developed by a subgroup by the IBIS, uh, IBIS group. And it has, a, you know, a whole bunch of things that you can go through and check in order to get a better idea as if to whether, um, your, your IBIS model is good quality. And it also tries to assign a quality level, which I always thought was a good idea. So you can assign it, you know, is it, is it good enough to simulate? Is it really good? 
and they kind of give you a better way to you know see how you can still deal with and, and use the model, okay? And then you need to simulate the IBIS model, right? So the simulated image is a simple test load and just make sure, you know, make sure that it transitions, you know, if it's a 3.3 volt model, make sure that it transitions, you know, to 3.3 volts fully. Make sure that the edge rates are, are you know, within 5 or 10% of what the data sheet value says. And you also need to correlate the IBIS model. Um, and again, we, you know, we talked about, you know, getting the SPICE model from the vendor, having the vendor provide correlation data. You know, there's actually something, a uh, keyword inside the IBIS specific called test data. Now, um, not a lot of people use it, but inside test data, it essentially allows you to store these, some of some people call golden waveforms. It allows you to store these type of correlation data waveforms. So in theory, you can have that data inside the IBIS model file, right? And then use that to correlate your IBIS model simulated into any EDA tool, which is a really nice way to go. Okay, so I've got a question about is there an Fmax parameter for IBIS IO models? How would you determine this parameter? There isn't really, right? So again, part of the part of the limitation of the IBIS model and how fast you can switch it is going to be based on that voltage time uh, waveform window, right? So that sort of overclocking issue that I brought up before. But there's different um, ways to sort of get around that, and it's mostly based on the EDA tool you're using and how they're going to interpret that data. And I have something a little bit later on that shows you kind of how you can make your IBIS model um, switch fast enough. So hopefully that'll answer your question. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through sort of this flow and give you guys, you know, I'll show you how, how I do it um, in the IBIS DRC tool and I'll give you guys some ideas of, of how else to do it in general, right? And so the first one is running an IBIS parser, okay? Now again, you can run this within your EDA tool or you can run it standalone. The only recommendation I have for this is, is, is don't wait till you run your simulations. Like there's some EDA tools where it'll run the IBIS parser but it runs it in real time, right? So you have to set up a simulation in order to run it. So there's no point in setting up your full, like I said, a full 64-bit, you know, hundreds of signals to simulate, and then wait for the tool to crash and see that it's an IBIS error problem. There's, you know, get the standalone parser and run it from that and make sure that it works before you get too far along down the road. Right, so this is your first line of sight. And really, I say it has to pass with no errors. If you have errors, you got to fix it. Um, there's ways you can fix models. Um, I have a, like the top 10 in the IBIS model hacking book that you get a copy of. But sometimes you're going to have to go back to the vendor and say, this is an error. You need to regenerate a new model, um, and you have to fix this. Um, so someone's asking a question about, you know, if you have models, um, that has a growth there, you can see them, right, with what we're talking about, running the parser, looking at the data curves. Um, but what if the error is more subtle? It could still be wrong, but look kind of okay. And I, I agree with that. That's a good question. And I think the way to solve that is with custom model quality checks, which is what we'll look at in a minute. But first, we're, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the, the package pinout, okay? And so um, here what I'm showing is in, in, there's a package editing tool inside of DRC. What I do is I upload a CSV file from Excel or text, and I check. I check the pin name versus the signal name and the model type, okay, and make sure that there aren't any errors. You know, and the way I used to do this is I would do an Excel, right? So I get a Excel out, you know, file from the package, and then, you know, I would take it the the IBIS pin section, import that in, and then just run a simple macro to tell me if they're the same or different. So you can easily write an Excel macro or a script to check this for you which is what you probably want to do because if you've got like, you know, hundreds of pins in a BGA, it's just really hard to do that manually. But Excel can be your friend here or, uh, you know, if, if whatever EDA tool you're using has got some features to check this for you, then, then go with that. But you really want to check your package and make sure that it's one-to-one, -one, especially if you're doing post-board layout simulation, okay? Um, the other thing I talked about was viewing the, the data curves. 
right? And so this is again a, a manual way to find um, you know big errors. And you can see you can look at the data points so like this pull down. You can see that it should be you know monotonic, right? So if you saw a big glitch there, you can get a quick idea that there's something wrong with that. Maybe it's just a random data point. Anyways, looking at the, the data curves is a good way to get an intuitive feel for um, what's going on with your model. Now, running custom quality checks, OK? Um, and this is really, really what um, I built in the IBIS DRC tool, OK? And so I'll explain to you sort of how, how I progressed doing this from a manual to a scripting to a tool point of view. And hopefully, this will give you guys some ideas, right? But really, automation is key. You, you, you're just not going to have enough time to manually check everything in an IBIS model file continually, OK? Um, but you can start somewhere. And I'll give you guys a specific example. One time I was working on a project, um, and I was doing DDR3 analysis. And the EDA tool I was using you know, had a DDR type of wizard. Um, in order to use that properly to do all the, the skew timing and, and everything, it wanted to have specific keywords in the IBIS model called receive your threshold. So these allow you to, to have you know, process corner receiver thresholds more than a VN high and VN low. But the important thing to know is that I knew that I needed to have certain keywords in there in my uh, vendor IC memory models. So I started checking them manually. And then once I knew what I was looking for, I wrote you know, a little script that just grabbed and looked for those pieces. Right? So I started to automate slowly what I needed. And then eventually, over time, you know, you have one script, you have two scripts, a bunch of scripts, and then you turn it into a tool, OK? Um, and that way, you can kind of start up and build your own checklist. But maybe all you're doing is running DDR memory uh, SI simulations. So now, instead of looking at the whole entire IBIS specification, you only need to look at one piece. So you can certainly start slow and start manually, right, to build up your own checklist. But to really close the loop, you got to automate it somehow, right? If you write your own script or work with your CAD guys or, or you know, look on your ADA tool or, or, you know, talk to me about IDIS DRC, but you, you got to start somewhere, okay? And I'll tell you the way, the way that I do it is I have this column here called spec file data. So you upload a spec file that's based on these different parameters based on the IC data sheet. For example, you can see pull down impedance and pull up impedance, and then I check it against the IBIS model data. Now, this screen here is just a snapshot, but what I, what I do is I run a batch run on every model and the whole thing. It'll tell me if I had passed, failed, what I can ignore, and then you can open up a full HTML report and look at pass, fail, and go even deeper, right? And then there's, there's a bunch of quality checks that you can set in the spec file and also in the overall tool that checks generic things as well. Um, and and that's, sort of, that's sort of how you would close a loop and automate it, right? But like I said, you can start anywhere you're at and, and, and where you're capable, right? And, and that's, you know, like I said, that's where I started. Started with Excel scripts, and then there was Perl scripts before I moved to Python, and, and then I just automated all of this tool because I deal with uh, IBIS models so much. But really, this running these types of custom quality checks, right, and these types of checks is really where you go from that level of, of, of um, finding gross errors to finding really small errors. So for example, if we go back to uh, earlier where I said if you had an I.O. buffer that had the wrong output impedance and edge rate, these types of checks would catch that, OK? Um, these types of checks would catch you know, whether your die capacitance is within the right range or not. And so what this does is it allows you to almost really start doing some design analysis before you even start simulating, OK? And that's really, really kind of, to me, the secret power of IBIS modeling and kind of the beauty of it in terms of, you know, why it's a behavioral model. Because, you know, a spice model, remember, it's really more just a black box. You really have to simulate it to get anything useful out of it. But with an IBIS file, you can look at this data and manipulate it and use that to your advantage, OK? Uh, let's see, question. OK, someone says, uh, OK, I might be having a problem with my audio, so I'm trying to trying to get that to set up right. So sorry about that. The audio is going in and out on you. Um, so I have a little bonus here. This is talking about fixing the overclock data. And in a way, this kind of talks about um, working uh, how fast you can uh, switch an IBIS model. 
right? And I'll try and use this example to show that here's a transition going from a low to high of your voltage time data, right? So you can see that there's this, you know, what some people call dead time or initial lead time where it's zero and it's not switching, okay? And in theory, what you can do is you can cut this out and then move this whole curve in. So you can actually, you know, move in your transition data within your time window that you want to switch it at. And this is essentially what um, a lot of the EDA tools do now. Is they, they, now they allow you to set these, these flags essentially to tell them to cut the data if they can. And some of them will even try and manipulate the data or, I guess, reprocess it uh, in order to switch it like that. And it can get a little bit more complicated um, looking into the algorithms of this, but this is sort of how you would how you would fix it. Now, in theory, you would really want your IC vendor to do this because they generated the model, they generated the data, right? So I don't recommend you know going this deep and hacking your IBIS model. I mean, sometimes you have to, but um, in theory, you know, you should go back to your IC vendor and tell them that you know their their model's overclocked and they need they need to uh, fix it for you. But that's how you can kind of um, address that issue if you need to. Um, and the last piece is simulate and correlate, you know, and again, like this is showing the simulation and correlation piece in, in IBIS DRC, and so, you know, you know, for me, what, what I think is important is, is you really want to simulate this model in the EDA tool that you're going to use at the end of the day, right, because, you know, that's the tool you're going to use, that's your simulation results, that's what you're going to base your analysis on. So. Um, you know, for example, in IBIS DRC, you know, I could tie into different vendors who have programs like, you know, Synopsys HSpice, we're part of their membership program, so you can run HSpice right from the tool and import the waveform. But if you have a different tool, you know, you can grab the waveform and import it too, okay? And, you know, you can do this within your own uh, tool as well. I mean, almost all the EDA waveform viewers allow you to you know, import a raw text file or CSV file, and you can overlay and do the correlation. So that's not the, the most important piece. But down here, if you look at the correlation results, again, these are the metrics that I use, right? So like I said before, you know, a quick way to look at it is, is to look to see, you know, is there a big DC mismatch, you know, when, you're, when your IBIS model transitions from a low to high? Is it reaching steady state? And then you can look at these edge rates and compare them against, you know, whatever source material you have, whether it's uh, SPICE or lab data, right? And then, you know, in this case, it, this is a perfect correlation of, between a SPICE and IBIS model, so everything matches up fine. And then here, I actually don't call out the duty cycle, but you can see in the waveforms that they match up over life. So you can see that there's not a big duty cycle issue. So this is sort of a way to, in addition to running custom quality checks that with you simulating the IBIS model, and if you can get a hold of the correlation data, right, you can close the loop. So now you've checked the model against the data sheet, you've simulated it in your ADA tool, and you've also correlated your model back to um, original source model material. And so now, you know, and if you document this up, now you're done. Now you've got a complete IBIS model um, that's validated, simulated, and correlated, and you've got confidence your model is going to be good and you can move on to your simulations, right? And this is really sort of, you know, where you want to be and this is sort of, you know, we're kind of a tenant of, of simulation, not even just signal integrity, but, you know, you want to simulate but you also want to validate and correlate and you want to close the loop between simulation and measurement, okay? And so that was sort of the, the last piece of the flow. You know, and, and like I said, ideally you'd like your ID vendor to simulate the model they create and to uh, compare it even, correlate it to some sort of uh, source material, whether it's from actual silicon or a SPICE model, and give you that data, right, so that right from the beginning you have an understanding that the model will simulate and that it correlates fine. But you also want to do it on your own, I think, in your own EDA tool to make sure that, you know, your IBIS model work the way you expect it in your environment as well, okay? Okay, so I've been talking a lot here. So, summary, what did we talk about today? Give you guys a brief overview of an IBIS model why it's important. There's a lot more information in the in the uh, Hacking IBIS Model book. 
that even talks about how an IBIS model is generated and put together. Or there'd be too much material to cover in a one-hour webinar. You guys can definitely go and, and flip through the book and get a better understanding, maybe even more than you want to, um, but it's there. You know, and it's pretty easy to, I think, to think about and understand how model quality issues can cause product to fail. It's just not IBIS models. It could be S parameters, or it could be anything with simulation. When we talk specifically about IBIS models, remember, they're representing your drivers and your receivers. And if you have a driver that has electrical characteristics of uh, output impedance, of drive strength, of edge rates, of die capacitance, you want to make sure that your IBIS model matches up to those. And then, you know, I talked about what I call the seven deadly sins of simulation, how you can avoid them. And I wanted to give you guys um, kind of an overview of some flow of things that need to happen, also some specific issues that I see come up a lot. And there's a lot more, I think I go over like 10 of the most common ones in the book. And, and I also talk about how to solve them. And lastly, I talked about how to take control of model quality simulation. And this is really about putting the flow together, okay? And again, it, it can be a manual flow. You can use Excel spreadsheets. You can scripting. You can use an EADA tool. What's really important to me is that is that you guys use something, right? Is that you start somewhere, and that you have at least have something in place to catch the biggest errors, and then over time you can work your way to to really clean them out. Um, so someone has a question back about removing dead time at the beginning of a high-low transition, um, whether the delay is part of the intrinsic behavior of the device. And it's not, actually. So I know it's a, it's a little confusing if you haven't looked at that before. There's more information in the book. But remember, it's a behavioral model. So, so if it takes like five nanoseconds, say, to go from transition from a low to high, if you shorten that up and say now it takes two nanoseconds, you're right in a way. You're kind of messing with the time the clock output of the IBIS model. But remember, if you go back to the way flight time delays are calculated, you subtract that out anyway. Because that flight, the, the time the clock out in an output IBIS model isn't accurate. It's not designed to actually represent that delay of the actual device. So you, you always subtract that out anyway. In a way, that's why you can manipulate with it. So it, it, it's a little confusing. Um, if you've just encountered that, but if you go and look in the book and you know um, and and see it, then I, I think it'll become more clear for you. And then lastly, again, you know we have this IBIS DRC tool that kind of does all this for you in automated flow. You know, go beyond the IBIS parser and run you know over 75 custom design rules, um, creates reports. You can do simulation correlation, and um, if you guys are interested in this tool, you can you talk to me about it offline. Okay, that was it. Try to get that all within an hour. Okay, so we've got got some time left. If you guys have any questions at all, um, try to answer them along the way. So thank you for asking those questions. And let's see what we got here. All right, someone said I did a great job. Well, I appreciate that, of course. <laughs> so, um, uh, so yeah, if you guys have any uh, additional questions, uh, feel free to ask them now. Um, we've got a couple minutes left. Not seeing any hands raised here. So, um, okay, we got a couple questions. Um, so, someone's asking that if they want to test their interconnect model, say like an S parameter or a spice network, does it make sense to catch like a generic IBIS model and run a time domain so they can check the validity of your interconnect model? Um, you know, it's an interesting question. I guess it depends on. Uh, what you're trying to check. Um, so, for example, if I have an S parameter, I want to, I want to check like is it is it passive, is it causal, is it uh, data uh, integrity issues. I would probably just look at like you know insertion and return loss and passivity and not run a simulation. But in order to run a time domain simulation, you're right. You know, I might want to see you know um, you know when it does an FFT or IFT, however you're going to do it. Well, it work. It could make sense to do that. So yeah, I might take like, say, a simple TTL driver and drive it, um, and and use that to drive uh, my S parameter model, and just make sure that it switches through and it looks the way it behaves. You know, and vice versa. It doesn't have to be S parameter. Sometimes I'll do that when I'm checking like transmission line models that I build. Because the 50 ohm 
uh, transition line model and I have an IDEF model that I know has an edge rate and output impedance, then I'll drive it and, and I kind of have an idea of what the expected output would be. Uh, okay, so good question. Uh, someone's asking me, am I going to tackle or address AMI models in time? I am. You know, I didn't want to put those uh, in here because that's a pretty in-depth topic, but um, I know there's actually a panel I didn't go this year at DesignCon where they were talking about IBIS AMI quality issues in specific. And um, so, yeah, that's probably going to be a future webinar because that that is a problem, um, you know, for you guys that are aware or not aware, you know, the IBIS AMI, is, I kind of view it as a, a sub-stack of IBIS and it allows you to include, like, these executable models that essentially represent equalizations of drivers and receivers. It's really used for really fast service interfaces. But there's a lot of issues with setting those up and kind of going through and making sure that your equalizer, your clock data recovery, and all that fun stuff is working the way that you think it is. So, yeah, stay tuned. Um, we're going to be doing some information on that uh, in the near future. Okay, it's got about 30 seconds left. And um, one last question about IDIS uh, 5.0 models. You know, um, I kind of left those out because there's still some things going on with IBIS 5.0 um, in terms of does it actually, will it be able to represent your I.O. buffer depending on the I.O. buffer design. So real quick, so you guys aren't aware, and there is some information in the IBIS book about this. Um, so IBIS 5.0, some people call it power. But basically, you add some extra data curves, some, some IT and some, some IV curves that represent the pull-up and pull-down of your power structure, because right now with the generic IBIS model, the IV curve, they really the current in that doesn't represent the entire buffer. And so what happens is the IBIS group had to go back and add some extra curves with data, you know, abstracted the right way. And so now in theory, you can get the current of the full buffer uh, switching, which you really need in order to do um, power delivery analysis. So there are vendors that are giving out IBIS 5.0 models. And some of them work better than others. So my recommendation is if you're going to do IBIS 5.0 and you're getting from a vendor, make sure they give you correlation data and make sure that the correlation data shows you that their IBIS model um, is predicting not only the right um, voltage rail fluctuation, but also the right timing data. Because that's one of the issues that some people have been talking about, and I've seen myself, is that um, some IBIS 5.0 models aren't recording the right essentially timing penalty delay. So um, if you're going to use those, make sure you get correlation data. Um, is the presentation going to be made available? Yep, it is. So uh, probably by Monday, you guys will, everyone will get a follow-up email. Um, they'll have a link to the book, and it just, they'll have a link to this presentation. I did record it. As long as that recording works, I'll have that up too. So I know you guys are just dying to go back and uh, rewatch this. Okay, so I'm about a minute over, so I'm going to cut it off here. So I just want to thank all you guys for attending. I appreciate it. I appreciate the question. Hopefully you guys learned something. Hopefully um, you got a better idea of what you need to do to go tackle your IBIS model quality issues. So thanks again for attending, and um, you know, stay tuned. Hopefully you joined our newsletter. Stay tuned for our, our next webinar. Thanks a lot for coming, and have a good week.